Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Luke Johnson from Noetic.app, the intelligent social media platform and application for your Google and iPhone devices. Dr. Jonathan Cook and I will be discussing Edith Wharton's The Mother's Recompense tonight. This is our third book, I believe, on Edith Wharton. Um, prior to our show beginning, Dr. Cook and I were talking quite extensively about my new love for encyclopedic novels, but we're going to pivot back to our beloved Edith Wharton. So where should we begin this conversation, Dr. Cook? Uh, well, uh, let me just say that this book isn't that well known. So if you've read uh, The Age of Innocence and um, The House of Mirth, this is probably the book you should read after those because it's, um, it's got a great storyline. It's a gripping plot. And um, it it's um, you know got some of her typical themes about the perils of eros, which is one of her great topics. Like uh, many of her books follow this 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 theme of uh, the uh, truthful depictions of what can go wrong in relationships and uh, how contingent our lives are. Um, really, especially our romantic lives. Accidents happen all the time, you know. Happily Ever After is um, is a useful myth that we <laughs> hold dear to ourselves. So uh, anyway, should we begin where where the book was written and how it was written and... Yeah, I would just, of... I want to add this. I said this to Dr. Cook before we began that, um, and he's gonna be doing a lot of the illumination of the core themes of this text. What I enjoyed about this, although it's kind of a secondary or tertiary theme, I'm not sure how much critical commentary there is out there on this. Actually, I think The Mother's Recompense is a, is a little bit overlooked in terms of critical commentary. I didn't have a ton of background research this time around, and I wonder if that was me or, or what. Maybe you can speak to that a little bit as well. But what I enjoyed about this is that it seemed a little bit like there were worlds colliding. Not only do we get a more mature, uh, a, hair, a female uh, lead character. You get a woman in her mid forties, which is a departure from what we've had in the other novels. But um, there are elements of of war in this, and I, I never really could imagine Edith Wharton uh, incorporating aspects of war. So I kind of like the mixture of the high society with the brutality of war in this. Although it's not a major theme, it was something that was intriguing to me. But that, that's, that's about all I have to say about the book, so I'll hand it back to Dr. Cook. And yeah, why don't you tell us about the genesis of the story? How, how did it come to be? Yeah, well, uh, Edith Wharton, um, she had sort of shifted her operation to France um, by the early teens. I mean, she spent a lot of time going back and forth to, the, to Europe uh, and uh, back to New York, or she built their, her beautiful mansion in Lenox, Massachusetts, the Mount, uh, which you can visit today. She built that in uh, starting in about 1900, 1900, 1901. And she, the irony is just as she had it all set up and beautiful and landscaped, she started spending more and more time in Europe and eventually settled in France uh, by, I think, about 18, 1911 or 12. And 1913, she divorced her husband. Um, but she was in Paris during World War I, and um, she was very active during the war. She, she got organized to um, help provide employment for seamstresses, and she eventually got a, a medal from the French government for her volunteer work and um, the the really incredible humanitarian work she did. Um, and um, after the war, she uh, decided she wanted to stay in France. And she bought a house on the Riviera, and she also bought a house about 12 miles north of Paris. So in the winter, she would go down to the house in, um, on the Riviera, and um, she spent spring and summer in, um, or I guess summer and into the fall in the house north of Paris. So uh, she was living there 
uh, when she wrote, in these two houses, when she wrote The Age of Innocence and published in 1920. Uh, she got a Pulitzer Prize for that. Then she published a beautiful set of four stories that she called Old New York, each of them about characters in New York in the 19th century, uh, based on her own, you know, some of the things that she knew growing up there. Um, and uh, in 1923, she had she she started this novel, The Mother's Recompense, and uh, published it in 1925. She serialized it in uh, something called the Pictorial Review because she could make a lot of money, more money than just publishing it as a book uh, by publishing it in this magazine serial publication. In fact, it was kind of a golden age for um, serial publication of novels and short stories. The teens and 20s, um, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald it could make a really good living publishing short stories during that period. She got um, $32,000 for um, the serial rights and then more money for um, when the novel was published by by Scribner's. And uh, of course, uh, you know, the book grew out of her concerns at this point as a, she's an older woman, you know, she's past 60 in 1922, she turned 60, so she's 62. Looking, looking at her life and of course she did not have any children but she knew people who had children, and of course, um, at sixty-two, her daughter—you know—if she had children, they would have probably been a little older than the the character Anne in in the novel. So she's sort of creating a hypothetical about what someone would do in a situation where she's fled her husband um, and going to live on the Riviera, and. Um, um, conceiving of what a mother-daughter relationship would be like if if she had one based on other people's experience and her own reading uh in in uh, her vast reading in the history of English and American and European literature um in fact I I should mention that there her book really belongs in a tradition of books about mothers who leave their husbands um, either for a lover or because of marital problems, but usually mothers who have left and they have and then somehow go back and are you know have to f live uh, adjust themselves to their children after leaving the family of course women at in the nineteenth century were um, belonged to what's called a cult of domesticity, and they were supposed to embody the values of the home, and um, they were supposed to be pious and um, uh, loving and devoted to their children, holding up high moral standards. And of course, if you left your husband with a lover, you were completely subverting this domestic tradition and and. Uh, um, so there's a there's a famous book called East Lynn published in 1861 in England, um, with a with a mother who's run off with her lover and and has to, you know, be deprived of her children. Um, Henry James was writing stories about misbehaving parents and the impact of this bad behavior on their children. What Maisie knew is probably the best known book in this tradition. And Wharton herself had written a little bit about this sort of thing, so it was, it was sort of a, 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 a situation that had been worked over in literary tradition as as sort of the, the disgraced wife syndrome and how, she has to live a life of exile from her own children, when uh, and the fact that she's never forgiven for her waywardness um why, why did this become a a theme in american literature at at that time it was it just a coincidence that these authors started writing about these things or were they responding to something um well i think i mean it's not a big strain in this tradition but of course you know henry james wrote about a million different kind of scenarios and husbands and wives and families and whatnot so 
Um, I think in the later 19th century, um, women were getting more independent. There, there was, um, you, were le- you, you weren't as doomed if you didn't get married to be miserable and poor your whole life. There were opportunities outside of wedlock to make a living as a woman. The new woman was was uh, supposed to be, um, you know, someone who who was looking for new freedom to work outside the nuclear family, and uh, so this was a this was a a trend that was taking place, and um, you know, within Victorian literature, uh, the sanctity of the home was everything, and and. Um, women who were adulterous, of course, bore a huge stigma, like, um, um, you know, Bleak House of Charles Dickinson, you know, Esther Summerson's mother had her out of wedlock, and this is the terrible disgrace that is the secret of the whole book, you know, who is the father and what has happened to the, you know, how the mother has been hiding this fact that this woman, uh, this young girl, the narrator of part of the story is her daughter. Um, so it's a automatic plot device to have a story like this. And I think for Wharton, in the early 20th century, things were much more open because divorce laws had been uh, liberalized. And in the 1920s, of course, there was a whole new mores. You know, the post-war America was much more promiscuous and women were really kind of flaunting their freedom. Uh, So in a way, Wharton, writing in the 1920s, she was trying to kind of be contemporary with people like F. Scott Fitzgerald, you know, because Gatsby was published in 1925. So in a way, she was was trying to join the the generation of writers who were one, one generation below her in terms of taking on themes of... um, you know, uh, sexual mores being challenged and um, uh, so um, she, you know, she she actually was friends, well, she met Fitzgerald, she was friends with Sinclair Lewis. She actually spent a bit of time, they had a quite a close relationship with each other. Lewis's Aerosmith was published in 1925. Fitzgerald met her and said how much he loved her work. And then later on, he sort of said some nasty things about Mother's Recompense. I think it was just out of jealousy. Um, uh, But um, so uh, you can you can get a sense of that sort of jazz age feel when she goes to when the character Kate goes to New York and um, sees her husband's her in-laws. And there's a there's a woman named uh, uh, Lila Gates who is sort of a flapper who loves to dance and she's got some kind of boy toys all around her. Uh, so that that world is um, one we see. It's kind of fun to, to look at that from her, the eyes of the character Kate Clifane coming back from Europe after being away for almost for 20 years or so. Um, to that post-war world of New York City where everything is fast and people are sort of burning the candle at both ends. So I think you've painted a really good picture, Um, but if uh, Wharton was in her 60s when she was writing this and childless, uh, uh, what aspects of the novel are autobiographical? Yeah. Well, um the 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 affair that Kate had with this guy Chris Fenno, um, of course, the whole story is premised on the the bizarre accident that the man that Kate had the affair with, um, a younger man, um, he actually fought in World War One. She she had the affair just maybe beginning uh the beginning of the war and then of course the US didn't join the war until 1917 so he fought in the war and then he goes back and uh, is wounded and is rehabilitated and his nurse one of his nurses of course is Kate's daughter who falls in love with him and so the daughter wants to marry this guy Chris who had the affair with the mother and that's her 
that's her dilemma. What is she going to do about that? But Wharton, Wharton probably wouldn't have been able to write this story unless she had something comparable, which is when she was 46 and married um, to Teddy, you know, who was 12 years younger, uh, older than she was, and they had a sexless marriage. There, there was something radically wrong with their physical relationship, but they, they kind of stuck it out and tried, you know, they did a lot of entertaining and they did a lot of travel and he turned into sort of a good companion who was good at choosing wine and um, sort of a gracious host, but totally unintellectual like she was. So uh, in 1908, when she went to France uh, that year, she got to know, well, she act, she met this guy earlier. He was a friend of Henry James, Morton Fullerton, who's a fascinating uh, American who was actually only three years younger than she was. He was the chief foreign correspondent for the Times of London. And he was living in Paris, and he's a very well-educated guy. He went to Harvard, and um, he's he, he wrote essays. He's uh, spoke French, well-traveled. Um, and for Edith Wharton, it was sort of like... Um, uh, a revolution in her emotional life because she fell desperately in love with him and he was a real uh, kind of Lothario uh, who actually had relationships with both men and women, mainly women but he had a he had a gay affair with uh, a well-known British aristocrat um, and he was friend with, friends with Henry James, although not his lover uh, but he also was engaged to his cousin Catherine back in the U.S., who was, um, I think, about 20 years younger than he was. Um, and so when Wharton had this affair, she had a very torrid affair, and she wrote him passionate letters for, for a couple of years, and they keep they kept it totally hidden. No one really knew about this relationship until the 1970s, because I think the letters were... Um, uh, they had a time uh, restriction on them, uh, the letters that she wrote to uh, Fullerton. So the affair of Kate and Chris Fenno obviously mirrors this torrid relationship with uh, with Fullerton, although um, you know their relationship was 1908-1909. The story, the relationship in the book is about, what, 1914-15, the beginning of the war. And um, of course... Uh, Chris Fenno is significantly younger than she is. Uh, it says that the affair took place six years before the beginning of the story proper, which uh, would have meant that she was 39. And it's a little bit ambiguous how much younger he he is. I mean, she says at one point um, 11 years, and then another another point 14 years. It's kind of funny in the beginning of the book, she's trying to re re piece together all the dates and you're really not really sure what the dates are. But as far as her age, it seems like 45 is the one that she ends up realizing, you know, is her age. So uh, the age difference between her daughter, who's 21, and Chris Fenno is either he's either 31 or 34 um, so he's still a bit older than she is, but not that much. Um, so, um, and the house uh, that Wharton had on the Riviera, I'm sure, is in the world that she knew all of the exiled Americans and British on the Riviera, the, the sort of um, second-class society that she subsists on because the everyone else kind of has fallen out of their social realm where elsewhere in the world i mean there's an aura of sort of mediocrity about some of these people um and i wharton must have known some of these people of course she herself had some really brilliant friends who visited her there um at her house but she she knew the people around her in this a t small town called Hayer, uh, right next to the Mediterranean. Um, so, as usual, she's taking little pieces of her life 
and uh, putting together the story. I think Kate Clefane's um, uh, discontent with her marriage and her stodgy husband, who was a bit older than she was, very much based on her uh, Wharton's relationship with her husband Teddy, um, who was, I mean, he was much, he was a little more affable than the than the husband in the novel. The the character in the novel is really kind of a total. Um, party pooper and a and a and a very uh, stern and dismal kind of man who is is sort of stuck in his um privileged social world and his mother kind of reflects his his stiff values so Wharton's but I think Wharton knew that world when she got married she did a lot of socializing uh, in New York City and in Newport and she really knew these the wealthy people of her time very well because she she was very well positioned to know lots of people and uh, she knew what it was like to be sort of uh, an outsider because of her intellectual interests her her peers in that world of the gilded age did not really read they weren't intellectual i mean they might have once in a while, they might um, have some special interest. You know, Andrew Carnegie collected art and antiquities and things like that, but they were not intellectually distinguished except um, to make money. Um, so she felt, uh, Wharton felt very much like an outsider and going to Europe finally to live permanently, I think represented her rejection of of America as a place that was just too intellectually arid to live in comfortably. Um, so that, that is sort of, those are the building blocks of the story based on her life. Um, so if we flash forward to 2020, the, the new roaring twenties, right? Uh, what would individuals from this decade find fascinating about this novel that's set in the jazz age how does it how does it speak or resonate with them okay uh i think um it it really it just gives you an idea of um what it's like to have a a sort of upper class world of money and privilege i mean we're 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 sort of in a new gilded age ourselves with this vast inequality we're living in today um and uh but the the bo- the basic dilemma of the novel is i mean i don't it's not really uh i mean it's not something you could have really written about in the in the in the 19th century so it's a very contemporary topic to have a woman whose daughter has fallen in love with a man that you had an affair with. I mean, because that, that's still a, a, a hot topic. You know, I don't, I mean, I, I can't think of anything comparable. Um, has anyone, has anyone imitated Wharton? I mean, in this respect, like a contemporary writer kind of borrowed this plot idea? Borrowed, yeah. Well, we don't really have... I mean, she's officially considered a novelist of manners. And really, the, only, the closest we could come to that today in terms of the, the, the manners of the upper class is... Well, I mean, there's some lesser known people, but... I mean, Jonathan Franzen is a, is a novelist of manners of the middle class, the upper middle class. Um... And his novels have some of the same sort of complications, erotic complications, as as Wharton does. But the great thing about Edith Wharton is she she really nails it in terms of understanding how romantic relations can go every kind of direction, you know, up, down, sideways. I mean, there's no norm for her. Everyone wants something they you know the women and the men want to be with each other but nothing ever is perfect uh, which is a great lesson for for all everyone all the time i mean in a way she she sort of you know she you could say she's sort of following up on thomas hardy and um 
the perils of eros um but of course she yeah you know, she read hardy but she wasn't really deeply influenced by him he was too much uh involved in his sort of rural world she's very much an urban and cosmopolitan uh character um so uh but I think and people who read this book will be pleasantly surprised by just how gripping the plot is, you know, because you just get caught up in it and you just don't know where it's going to go. You 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 just are sort of guessing what the next is behind the next door in the in the plot. It's a real kind of labyrinth. Although it's not a very long book, it's only about 200 pages. Yeah. Oh, it just, that just reminded me, um, it's, it missed the public domain by one year because it was published in 1925. Uh, we have to wait one more yeah. year before, yeah. uh, it, it enters into the public domain. Otherwise I would have made it, I would have turned this into an audio book. I don't think anyone has before that reason. So I thought about doing it, but I didn't want to. Well, I think it'd be, it's very ripe for a good movie version. I mean, if they made The House of Mirth, uh, what, 20 years ago, Age of Innocence was done about 20 years ago. This book is certainly uh, waiting for a good director, I think. Well, you, you're the one who introduced me to it. I'd never heard of it before. Yeah. You know, I, which I, I guess we'll talk about the, the critical reception of it or whatever <clears throat> towards the end of this conversation. But uh yeah i i you're the first person to ever suggest reading uh this book you know i i read ethan Frome when i was like 14 yeah and obviously um house of mirth and age of innocence i think everyone is familiar with those titles but getting into this book the mother's recompense i learned about this other book she has called it's called mothers and daughters right well is that, the, is that what it's called no well there's a book called the children which is about uh, children parental relationship, but mothers. This is sort of a preoccupation of her. The 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 book that or the story that comes closer to this is called the Old Maid, which was one of the novellas of Old New York, um, and that tells a story about a, a woman who has a child out of wedlock and then secretly goes back to be its governess and is never recognized for who she is. Um, and um, it's it, because it was unthinkable that uh, she could face the shame of uh, acknowledging the fact that she had the child out of wedlock. Um, but um, well, maybe maybe the reason why I thought there was something about her having a book called Mothers and Daughters because in the critical literature. Uh, it, it illustrates this theme so much, or maybe there's a quote that jumped out at me. I, there's this quote, mothers and daughters are part of each other's consciousness in different degrees and in a different way, but still with the mutual sense of something which has always been there. A real mother is just a habit of thought to her children. Maybe I got it from that quote, but yeah, well, she's very good about uh, how, um, bonded mothers and daughters are and just how they can be each other's worst enemy and they can be sisters you know this this weird paradox <clears throat> and especially for a woman in her position you know she's coming back to her daughter who's not known her has only known her as a as a kind of um invisible presence in her life because the family refused to um uh, allow contact between the mother and the daughter and now that her her grandmother has died she's no longer um kind of under the supervision of the husband's family and um so now they're they're going to have to test out the relationship and of course in the beginning it's it's like oh my god you know where have you been all my life and then of course the daughter Anne is when the mother is trying to keep the daughter from marrying this guy that she had an affair with, she's throwing all these roadblocks in her way. And the daughter is, is like saying, you know, how could you do this? You know, get out of my life. You're horrible. So it's kind of reminds me of <clears throat> the, the fierce competition that 
can happen between mothers and daughters when when things go wrong um and the hatred that that can suddenly appear but of course um they they move beyond that of course and 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 the mother allows the daughter to do what she she wants to do because she feels she has no choice she can't tell her daughter that she had an affair with this guy because she doesn't want to disgrace herself she the shame um that she feels in this situation is just <clears throat> making her desperate to figure out some way to stop it and then when she's trying to stop it of course she tells her daughter she shouldn't marry this guy because he's not really trustworthy he's kind of a ladies man and then <clears throat> of course the daughter is in touch with the the guy even though he's broken it off uh in compliance with Kate's request that he stop because she sees him privately and says you can't do this you know this is crazy and the the reason he goes back to the daughter is because he he um he feels like the woman is insulting his reputation he said he tells uh he says that the Kate has broken their agreement because she's ruined his reputation by saying he's not a good guy all he wanted was for her to you know let him break it off and then see, and then leave it at that but he he goes back together with the daughter because the daughter tells him that her her mother has been defaming him and um <clears throat> he can't take that as sitting down um so it's got all these wonderful plot twists that happen you know one after the other until <clears throat> until the very end and and uh you're kind of hanging on your seat to you to you find out what 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 happens in the last chapter so i think you mentioned while i was googling that quote uh, that this theme of this dynamic between mothers and daughters manifests itself in the work after this I, I, yeah, I, the, what, the what children was the name of that again, and, and what the, are some well, other of the later works that this theme gets developed in? Well, mainly the children, which <clears throat> is not really that well known. It's not considered one of her better books. Um, uh, the you know, it's children of an irresponsible parents, <clears throat> and um, um, some of her short stories as well. Uh, because she was, whenever she was, you know, she's writing short stories really for a lot of her life. I mean, she started out as a short story writer, <clears throat> produced two volumes of short stories. It, I um, feel like I read somewhere that she left an unfinished manuscript. Is that? Well, yeah, she left um, uh, The Buccaneers, which uh. was finished by another um, writer, um and that was actually made into a movie a few years ago. It's about really? the the arrival of uh, American young American women onto the London scene and their romantic involvements um, with the aristocracy because they're coming with these great fortunes behind them. So it's about the the sort of invasion of England by these these uh, families. That are trying to marry into the aristocracy uh, because they've got money. Interesting. Amer American families, yeah. So that was that was her, her her last unfinished work. She wrote a a book called Hudson River Bracketed after late in her life about an artist uh, figure. Um, and I mean, it's got some moments. It's it's not really uh, up to her best level. Um, so I'd say after the mother, the mother's recompense, um, she didn't quite reach the level uh, of those um, uh, the books you know that made her stand out uh, like Age of Innocence. Uh, although her uh, Backward Glance is a wonderful autobiography that she published <clears throat> at the end of her life, um, towards the end of her life. So, um, yeah, so one of the other themes, of course, that she was interested in is the is sort of evaluating America. And that comes in to the mother's recompense because she's she'd been living in in uh, France for um, uh, almost two decades. 
uh, when she was writing this book. And, uh, of course, a lot was changing in, 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 in the U.S. And she, you know, periodically she'd go back, but there was a long time when she wasn't back. She, keep, she eventually went back to get an honorary degree at Yale in the mid-1920s and was kind of shocked by just the pace of life. And, um, uh, of course, she still had friends back in, in, in the U.S., but she really couldn't take it. I mean, she was just too settled as a, as a European. Um, but you can see in Mother's Recompense that uh, you get a little sense of New York in the 1920s. I mean, people are driving around in their automobiles. They're going out to Long Island where her in-laws have a big house, the, the, the drovers, and uh, kind of reminds you about the world of Gatsby out in East Egg and West Egg. Um, after uh, war in the 1920s, you know the wealthy wealthy uh, millionaires were building out in in Long Island with their mansions, and they weren't they weren't going to Newport at this point so much. So, well, I, I we've we've tapped dance around this, but what what's your estimate of the of uh, Kate Clefane and her? Well, morality or how she handles this moral <laughs> dilemma. Well, I, it's a perfect illustration of the Hobson's choice, you know, two equally undesirable uh, choices. I mean, can she tell her daughter uh, to not marry this guy because she had an affair with him and the daughter would think of her mother as immoral because, of course, the mother ran off with a man because she was running away from her stifling marriage. And uh, and if she doesn't tell her daughter, can she live with the idea that <clears throat> her son-in-law is someone that she had had a passionate sexual affair with? I mean, both of them are totally mortifying and disturbing and uh, the kind of thing that <laughs> no one would want to have to live with or face. So she... Um, she, you know, she ends up with both choices, you know, two equally bad choices. Uh, I mean, she does tell her secret, not to her daughter, but to the man that she's supposed to marry, right? The, the kind of sympathetic family friend who always thought well with, of her, uh, you know, the bachelor who's her own age. And of course, when she she's talking to him and and um, she's hoping to get the whole thing off her chest. Uh, and he he thinks, she thinks that he knows what the secret is, but he thinks it's just the fact that she thought that um, Chris Fenno was not a good guy. I mean, he had no idea, and she thought he knew. So when she told him the truth, he, like, you know, fell out of his chair and she was so mortified by that because she thought that he knew and could sympathize. So that's the terrible twist of the knife uh, towards the end of the book is just when she thinks that she can unburden herself because the whole th story is about the weight of her conscience and the and the weight of her jealousy. And that's the great ambiguity is you don't know if she's jealous of her daughter or whether she just wants to prevent some kind of incestuous um, misalliance uh, by condoning their marriage. But I love also the scene with the, um, the, the, the minister, you know, the Reverend Arklo, when she goes to him to get advice. And of course, she says, I have a friend who has a terrible dilemma. And she explains the whole situation. And of course, the Reverend Arklo says, uh, this this can't happen. This is terrible, you know. And then he pauses and he thinks, well, now that I think of it, you know, maybe it can happen as long as there's not, you know, what they're, they're and no one ends up with a sterile pain. So the minister condones it. And that's kind of why she 
she doesn't uh, she let she lets herself allow the marriage you know she doesn't sort of run into the middle of the wedding and say this you know stop <laughs> i mean do you remember that scene with the minister going to him <clears throat> and uh he's supposed to be the supreme uh sort right. of wise person right. to to tell her about that and it just shows that he 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 can't and he doesn't know how to deal with his dilemma it's like it's, a reverse graduate <clears throat> scenario. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The where you where you described it like interrupting the wedding. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh yeah, well actually the scene in the wedding is kind of fun because the you actually think that maybe he's not going to show up because he's late and of course in her head she's saying I guess he's he backed out, you know, he lost his nerve, you know, cuz they're not there. And uh, she's saying, you know, what's happening? We got to call this whole thing off. It's going to be terrible. But, uh, you know, maybe she's going to be relieved. And then, of course, he shows up. Um, and uh, and the whole thing just moves forward. It's it's sort of this, this juggernaut that she can't stop. Um, and that's what I, I love about it because it she she's just trying to figure out what where she can uh where the weak points are you know she talks to chris and she talks to her daughter but she can't tell the daughter the truth uh and then her daughter finds out that she went down there to see him personally to stop the marriage and that is like kind of the last straw for the daughter the the mother actually going in person to see this guy because the daughter thinks that the mother just knew this guy as someone um somehow she doesn't know she you know the mother says well i knew this guy and that's that's why i don't think you should marry him but of course the daughter has no idea exactly how how she knew him um, so are all these things we discussing the dramatic irony yeah, uh, that's involved in the development of the story. Have we have we covered kind of all the uses of the dramatic irony here? Well, that's what's so great about Wharton. I mean, she and and uh, Thomas Hardy are just masters of this scene, uh, romantic scenes where things just go completely wrong through these freak accidents. Um, I mean, the fact that. This guy was wounded in the war, and he's rehabilitating, and he meets the daughter, and then, um, uh, you know, so they're involved with each other, and the fact that um, uh, these uh, sort of crazy uh, coincidences, and the the fact that the daughter is so determined uh to uh you know she's not willing to give him up because um uh i mean the 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 irony is that <clears throat> you know maybe he that this guy chris fell in love with the daughter because he the daughter reminds her him uh, sorry of of the mother and the daughter has this sort of stubbornness that she apparently inherited from her father um and then the fact that Kate, um, when she's not able to stop things, one night she comes back when there's been a dinner and she sees her daughter and this guy in the daughter's bedroom kissing. And she's like, wants to scream. Um, and um, But she's completely helpless to do anything at this point because um, she's already um, sort of realized that um, she, she, she just would, she can't face the shame and the disappointment. Well, I guess, you know, it's more the shame and horror of, of destroying her daughter's life a second time. I mean, she left the daughter when she was three years old and, um, has, uh, uh, been reconciled with her again. So she doesn't want to lose that contact with the daughter and then of course by the end of the book she she has to give the daughter up again <clears throat> so it's repeating the same pattern i'm scandalized uh, it's so wild um what what about its relation to the rest of the wharton canon i sort of superficially commented about 
why it was different from the other two novels that we've discussed. Could you go more in depth? Um, I know you've mentioned a little bit about how it affects things down the line, but could you maybe paint the picture of, of, of the totality here for our listeners? Well, there's another great novella of Wharton's called The Reef about a, a guy who <clears throat> is, comes from the U.S. to marry his fiancée and then in the hotel where he's staying in London has an affair with a young woman who is, uh, is supposed to marry the woman's son. So these secret uh, last-minute um, complications to marriage are, are classic Wharton. Uh, and that's only about 120 pages. That's a really great story from, I think, um, sort of uh, about 1912 uh, or 13. And then, of course, Age of Innocence is about um, a woman, or uh, no, the, the male character, Newland Archer, um has an you know he doesn't have the affair that he wants uh with uh Ellen Olenska and he has to sort of sacrifice uh by the end of the book and and remain in his marriage but of course the the theme of course is the the weight of society in this uh, keeping the individual uh, uh bereft of their of their romantic choices um and um so uh i would say the reef is is you know has some very interesting similarities in terms of the uh the hidden relationship that you can't that can't be divulged um and um of course the old maid which is the, the novella as part of the set of four novellas old new york which is a wonderful uh sequence of stories that was published just before uh, the mother's recompense about the woman who had the child and then and then was never allowed to be recognized as as the mother and was thought to be this sort of tragic old person who uh, never married um and um so let's see. Yeah, that's those those are the stories that that stand out. Um So how did how did this go over with the public and with critics when it when it first came out? Cuz obviously obviously these are pretty startling themes or Yeah. Uh, or at least I think so. I mean, what what was the reaction? Uh yeah, I mean it, it sold well. It did not um, have the impact that The Age of Innocence did, uh, which won the Pulitzer Prize. I mean, it was it was recognized as being, you know, vintage Wharton. Um, it probably sold, I mean, I don't have exact figures, but, you know, typical book of hers at this point, maybe 50,000 copies. Um, and... Uh, she definitely um, was recognized as being one of the leading American writers at this point. Um, this is, is is sort of a period when the naturalists were, you know, Theodore Dreiser wasn't really that well known, although he did publish the, the American Tragedy in, uh, what, 1928. So Wharton loved that book, read it, um, but she she was really one of the leading novelists and she got probably the best money uh for serial publication at that point in the in the twenties. Um and actually the mother's recompense, the title she borrowed from an old novelist called named Grace Aguilar. Um and um uh, uh you know the title, of course, is ironic because what what she gets as her recompense is really nothing. You know she gets kind of shortchanged um, in the end, and is back where she started in the begin from the beginning of the book at the end of the book. Um, so uh, it, well, it yeah yeah I, I guess that naturally leads me to the question about how I, I guess you kind of alluded that. 
that or maybe you were making a, a prediction that it might be turned into a movie and if it's gaining steam are you or are you working on a critical essay of it right now usually when we we talk there's always something cooking uh, in the background. Uh, no, uh, but of- I, at some point I may turn to this. I know there was actually, I looked at a screenplay uh, of this novel back in uh, the late 90s because my sister is in the movie business and she sent me, when I recommended this book for a movie, she sent me a screenplay that she she had uh, seen. So people definitely know this as a good, uh, as a great um, compelling plot line. And I just hope, you know, somebody at some point picks it up uh, because she definitely was getting some of her work done um, either in uh, the U.S., you know, Martin Scorsese or or in England. Um, But it's interesting because the book, I don't think it's really been um, written about very much at all. I mean, there's only three critical articles in the JSTOR um, which is the archive of scholarly articles on e- Wharton's work. Of course, there's several parts of critical works that talk about it. Um, but I think generally its reputation is getting more and more um, positive. And I think if just there was a good movie made, then people would just uh, say, oh, wow, look at, the, you know, there's another Edith Wharton novel that is, that is worth reading. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think we might be the first ones to ever talk about it online like this, which is always fun. And uh, I don't know. I'm available for for uh, <laughs> to be cast as the lead. <laughs> as as Chris, interested. yeah. So fascinating. Well, that. Thank you so much, Dr. Cook. Was there anything else that you wanted to include before we bring uh, this episode to an end? Uh, no, there isn't. But I, I just want to plug Edith Wharton again, just how much of her work uh, is really out there to sample. I mean, I've been reading around in some of her lesser known works. I mean, I read her book about World War I, uh, her novel about World War I, A Son at the Front, um, which is, uh, it's a compelling story. It's it uh, tells you a lot about what it was like to be in Paris during the war, in the home front. Uh, but I also read um, uh, Glimpses of the Moon, which is a, a book that she wrote uh, in about 1922. That's a very romantic story, but it's it's very it's very touching. Uh, it has a happy ending, um, and it's very glamorous. The the couple who um, are the main focus, live in a world of lots of uh, wealth and privilege, but they themselves don't have it. And um, it's it certainly holds your interest. So uh, Wharton wrote, wrote a lot of books that um, don't get read that much. And um, I just, it's, it's always good for people to just dig up some, some of her work that has been overlooked. It's always rewarding to, you know, yeah. find these. Well, these... I think we're helping her through this project. So. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, Dr. Cook, let's uh, bring this episode to an end. Okay. I want you to stay on the line for a little bit so we can talk about what we want to cover next, but I want to thank everyone for listening. You, this will be up on the YouTube and SoundCloud channel later tonight, early tomorrow morning. Um, and it's, uh, and we'll get this. I have a lot of back. I have a lot of uploading to to the Noetic app uh, that I'll be taking care of this week. So we'll get that all caught up as well. And I want to thank you again, Doctor. Yes, Cook, thank you. That was fun. All right. Okay. Okay. Bye bye.